Thank you so much, Mike. And as my slides are coming up, um, just want to thank everybody for attending today. And part of my job in looking at the physical and chemical characteristics of biochar is to cover just some of the basics and just an overview. Because as the next session of um, the seminar comes and we start talking more about applications and designing biochars, we'll get more into the, um, the physical structure, the chemical structure. So my goal and my hope is that I demystify some of that. And I know that even some of our attenders, they're chemists. And you know, you know more than um, a lot of us on all these different specifics. But that's part of what my job is today. Because for me, when I deal with biochar, I see it generally out in the field, um, in fields in Central America, Haiti, Africa. I see it being made, and I work with more of the traditional style biochar production. Um, as we go through some of these slides, just want to make sure I did my best to give references where it was due. And you'll also see in a couple of these slides, you'll see up in the corner Hal Collins, ARS. He is my mentor and one of my best friends and was able to, um, I used some of his slides in that process. You've heard really um, from Kurt and Mike really a good overview of, of what biochar is. So I think we all understand that and the different names that it goes by. But when we're talking about biochar, um, Mike just did a great job at looking at gasification. But we also have different methods of production. Um, in that pyrolysis field, we've got some, um, we've got slow. We've got fast and we've got flash. And the differences between those tend to be the technology that's used, the residence times, how long your, um, your biomass is held at that temperature, and then how long it cools and what the temperatures that are at. And one of the general ideas is that, for the most part, slow pyrolysis gives us some of the best chemical and physical properties that we start to use when we're talking about it as a soil amendment, as a remediation tool. And that is, even though slow pyrolysis is definitely more that traditional when you think of um, a kiln, however, we still are becoming very, very technologically advanced in how we make um, different batches of biochar in that process. And as we're going through this production of biochar, there is this constant struggle of what is it that you're after. Um, as you heard, you can either have gas, you can have oil, or you can have the solid structure of char. And that becomes the manufacturer's prerogative. That becomes where is that money that we can get from the production of char? What is the greatest value added? And so at different temperatures and different methodologies, the producer and the end user are always struggling to see um, what, is, what is it that they're after. And if you're after char and you're after the solid, then you're going to go for lower temperatures. If you're after the gas production for energy, like in gasification, then you're going to use that methodology. So it becomes this struggle back and forth between economy and, and purposes of what's there. You know, we've talked a lot about biomass, but just a reminder that anything that has biomass, anything that is organic can generally be used to create to biochar, charcoal, um, crop residues, nutshells, walnut, um, orchard, vineyard prunings, um, sugarcane production, um, sugarcane waste, tobacco, olives, forest debris, um, animal manure is highlighted. That's what I work with a lot. Different grasses. So we can use a lot of different um, feedstocks in biochar production. And it's when we are looking at these feedstocks that the Pandora's box really starts to open up when we start talking about biochar. Because then again, it goes between that struggle of, am I looking at gas production? Am I looking for the bio oil? Am I looking for the char? What temperature? What heating rates? All of those go back and forth on what it is my end product is in my physical and chemical structures. And it comes back to that feedstock. And so this is just another um, general slide that kind of the same idea that Kurt showed us at the very beginning. But biomass goes in, and the products of pyrolysis and gasification are coming out. And what, in the end, is our final uses? So why do I take that? 
that time to go through that overview, go through those different processes, it's because your process in which you are creating your char and the feedstock are extremely important because every process and every feedstock is going to give you a different physical and chemical group of properties. There is no general uni um, universal characteristic for each char. Even when you're listening to the history that Kurt was giving us, every batch can be different. And so that's why when we're designing chars, we're trying to build up the scientific database on what these, charge, um, what these charges, um, chars are, what they look like. Because again, every feedstock and every methodology of creating the char is going to give you a different end product in its physical and chemical structure. However, there really are some universals. And so as I'm trying to pull open that box, there are those universals, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about in this in the next couple of minutes. And when we're talking about the physical structure, here's some of those universals. And each one of these can go deeper and deeper and deeper into the science and into the physics, into the structures. So again, I'm just giving an overview as we go through. The first universal is that these are, when we're talking about biochar, these are solid structures. These are that carbon base. They are these carbon rings that are put together in layers. They've got that structure. There's different layers that are there. And it is, it's, it's a solid. And some of the imagery that we'll see um, in some of these different photos really lends to that. There is a carbon backbone. And as you've heard, that can remain in the soil. They can remain that solid structure for 50 to, you know, up to a million years, depending on the environment, depending on the char, depending on the methodology. So there is a physical structure. We're not dealing with some imaginary structure. There is solid structure, and it is all this carbon backbone. When we're looking at that, that carbon backbone, you can see in this image you can see some of the you can see the distinctness that's there. That brings us to really that second um, that second universal is that our biochars they have high surface areas. When our biochars are going through the pyrolysis process in, in the more labile carbon and the hemicellulose and all the different fractions of the organics are being burned off, we're getting to that carbon ring. And when we get to that carbon ring, that's creating all of this open space. It's becoming all of these areas that have surface. And under slow pyrolysis, we can see surface areas that are sometimes up to 1,500 a meter squared per gram. And that's incredible. And that's generally universal. Depending on your temperature and your feedstock, those numbers are going to fluctuate, but they have a high surface area. And that allows for all the interactions and all the different characteristics of how they interact in soil, how they interact with different chemicals. But as a universal on the physical prop, um, basis, they have a high surface area. They also have, as a universal, they have porosity. As those rings and that surface area is all there, they're interlinked, that surface area and that porosity, all those holes, those holes, because of the carbon rings inside these structures, there's cracks that take place during the pyrolysis and carbonization process. And each one of those creates these avenues where water and air and nutrients can all go through. They help create that surface area. You'll have nanopores, which is really anything below 2 nanometers, and you'll have macropores that can be greater than 50 nanometers. And you put all those together, and it creates that surface area. It creates those areas for, for chemicals and for nutrients to interact. But as a general rule, and there's others, but these are the main three that you'll hear talked about within the literature, is that... When we're looking at the physical structures of biochar, 
The universals are, they are solid in their carbon rings. They have high surface area and they have large porosity. Um, and you've got all these different places that can interact inside their structures. This is just another slide that kind of gives you another visual of maybe what some of those structures look like. And as we start to transition into those chemical properties, how all of that carbon rings are starting to bind together in that process. And so as we start to talk about biochar, and we start to talk about these universals, this slide um, by Lyman in 2007 is one of those that you'll see, you just do a, Google, a simple Google search, or you watch or listen to any presentation on biochar, this is one of those graphics that you're gonna see. It's, it's going to say and show us that when we're talking about biochar, you've got that surface area that's large, you've got a cation exchange that's large, you have a high pH, and you've got carbon recovery, which all plays into how it gets used in the end. Physical universals, again, just brushing the surface. Then we start looking at some of that chemical structure, some of those chemical properties that are universal. The first, biochars are in their chemistry. You've got those carbon rings, but then inside those carbon rings, on the outside and on the surface, you've got functional groups. Here's just a simple graphic of just some of the different functional groups that we see in organic and inorganic chemistry. And um, the ones that just have a little bit different shading are some that we can see in bio biochar, and it's in no way an exhaustive list. So attached to these carbon rings, you can also have alcohol phenol groups, ketone groups, acid, bases, phenols. You can have circular esters and oxides. And all of those pieces come about with your feedstock and the temperature that you've, um, your feedstock and the temperature and the process in which you're creating those chars. And so every one of these different things can be a different piece inside that structure and that gives you biochar its chemical properties. It's giving it its charges and it has to do with these functional groups and everyone's going to be a little different. The other thing that we look at is that you've already heard it talked about just a little bit, but that chemistry wise, your biochar has the carbon rings and has our functional groups but it also has nutrients attached. And these next couple um, series of slides are just some examples of what some of those nutrients um, numbers can look like, what some of those are. You've got your nitrogen, your sulfur inside um, switchgrass and the digested fiber and what that looks like on the backside in the char. We are gonna have nutrients inside our char, but at different varying level, levels. When you look here at the um, different feedstocks here, we've got digested fiber and wood pellets. You heard Mike say that wood doesn't have as many nutrients and that digested fiber from animal manure does. And if you look back at that and you look, here you've got your digested fiber that's got a nitrogen of 22 grams per kilogram versus a wood pellet that's 1.3. The nutrients that are in your feedstock are going to become present inside your char but it's gonna be at various rates depending on what we're dealing with. Here's just another example of some switchgrass, some anaerobically digested fiber, and also some wood pellets. And you can look at the different mineral levels that we're finding in different biochars. So we're looking here and we're finding, um, and you know, if you look at copper, you have 162.9 milligrams per kilogram in that anaerobically digested fiber, but in switchgrass, it's 7.7. 7. Um, 7, 7. Looking at the differences there, dairies have copper on the field, you have different cop, um, copper uptakes from different things. But just to really reemphasize that we're gonna have minerals that are inside your biochar, and that's where a lot of this depends on the manufacturing factors and the soil and all the different things that you're looking for and so we can't just give one big formula for, um, for designer uses. We have to know the specifics, but we're gonna find nutrients that are there. 
We also are going to see in our chemical process, we're going to see that our biochars have a hot, high cation exchange capacity. So we understand that cation exchange capacity is really that ability to store and share the cations and the beneficial nutrients inside that charcoal, and we see it in soil so that we can, a plant can take it up, take those beneficial cations up, and then the ability of the soil to continue to replace those, find them, and really act like that storage and that sharing device. Biochars have very good high cation exchange capacities. They range sometimes from 70 up to 80, eight, excuse me, eight up to 70. And just as an example, you see there, I've got Quincy sand, which is a sand out of Washington state. It's got a 3.3 um, as its number, but an organic soil, it can be over 100. So biochars are going to fit into that medium range, and that's where the surface area and the porosity inside this physical structure comes to play inside our chemical structure. And it has that cation exchange capacity that's there, and it's going to be able to help us in those nutrients that are moving back and forth that are in that process. We all understand what pH is, but one of the things that we talk about a lot, and one of the things that you'll see thrown out in the literature is that we're always looking at the different pHs of each one of these chars. So I put it in um, into part of the chemical structure because we need, to we need to understand it as we can go into our next set of workshops. But as a general rule, the, um, as a general rule, biochars have an alkaline pH. And so they're going to go from 7 to 11. And I know, and I fully understand that that is a large range, but if we're talking about biochars um, that are being added to the soil, we have to understand that as a general rule, they have alkaline pH. And so if you have a already alkaline soil and you are dealing with crops and you're talking with something like phosphorus uptake, it may not be your, um, the best wisdom to add a char that's 11 in the pH scale to an already alkaline soil. And those are all different things that we need to take in effect. So that's why we like to cover it as part of those universals. I love pictures of biochar. Um, I'm a nerd. I love to teach, I love teaching, and I love being able just to visually see everything that we've kind of talked about. You've got your structure, you've got your carbon rings, you have your porosity, you've got nanopores, we've got cracks. And then you start talking about your chemical structures and you can see where because of the surface area and the porosity, then there's gonna be that higher cation exchange capacity. You can see where because of all those different features and those interactions, you can see where minerals can be trapped. You can see where microbe co colonies could be. You can see why water particles can get trapped in there, allowing for water content to be absorbed and increase water holding capacity. And you can see all those different pieces. In this next slide, um, you can see some of the microbial communities that are starting to grow and some of the cracks as this biochar was actually laden with, with cow manure. But universally, again, because I like to review, I tell it to you, and then I'll tell you it again as we finish up. But as we look at biochar, as we start to take and open up the black box, physically, some of the general rules in that physicality, that physical structure of biochar, is it's going to have a solid carbon structure. It's going to have high surface areas. It's going to have porosity. And we start looking at those chemical processes and that chemical structure, it's going to have functional groups that are connected. It's going to have minerals into it. It's going to have charge. It's going to have an alkaline pH. Those are the basics, but each one of those can be completely tweaked for whatever your feedstock is, where your feedstock came from, what type of soil your feedstock may have been grown in, and then how you manufacture it. So I hope that I've opened it up. I've given you the basics so that you can now dig deeper into what this looks like and that chemical and physical structure. Because now when we start talking about now what, and we start looking at our next seminar, how do we maximize carbon storage in the soil? How do we, um, how do we use biochar as a soil amendment from something from a Quincy sand in Washington state to a deep red clay here in Springfield, Missouri? Um, how do we deal with 
How can we use biochar and its physical and chemical properties to use it for remediation, to um, attach um, lead and other chemicals, both magnetically and even in like a sponge inside that structure? How do we use it to remove phosphorus, which is part of my fun and part of my favorite um, research that I got to do when I was working on my doctorate, taking in and sucking up phosphorus like a sponge and a magnet to help dairy farmers? Um, how do we design the chars to start really taking out or to be able to design exactly what we want? So hopefully that helped in that area of the physical and chemical structure. Again, I know it was basic, but uh, I encourage you to dig deeper and stay tuned for the next webinar that will be coming up in August.